So we'll continue the discussion of properties of wind to K, and today I will focus on mainly on total energies and forces and what we can do with these quantities. Now the first quantity you may want to calculate in a solid is its cohesive energy. The cohesive energy is defined as the difference of the energy of your crystal minus the energies of the free atoms according to the stoichiometry weighted according to the stoichiometries. Uh, the total energy alone is more or less I would say a meaningless quantity. It doesn't have any particular meaning. Only these differences they should be meaningful and define the cohesive energy and therefore the stability of a particular solid. Uh, when you calculate this energy difference it's very important that you do all the total energy calculations by the same input parameters, by the same quality. That means if you do your crystal, you usually do a scalar relativistic calculation for the valence electrons and a fully relativistic one for the core electrons. And you have therefore to do the same thing also for the atoms. That means we will not use the atomic energy, for instance, from this atomic code L star, because this is a fully relativistic code and would be incompatible. Its total energy is therefore not really compatible with the total energy of a crystalline calculation. That means also for the atoms, we have to do a crystalline calculation. That means we generate a big cell with a lattice parameter of about 30 bore. It should be best is if you select a face-centered box, but distort it. That may, means make A, B, and C slightly different. Something like 30, 30.1, and 30.2 bore or so, so that it breaks symmetry. By doing, doing so, it is breaking the symmetry. That means Px, Py, Pz may not be forced by symmetry to be equal and allows you then a full occupation if you have, let's say, two p electrons of a pz orbital, but none of px and py due to this distortion. You should do these calculations with the identical sphere sizes what you have done in your crystalline calculations. The same Rkmx, just one k-point is of course sufficient, and atoms, most of the atoms are open shell systems, so you should do them spin polarized because this gives a lower total energy. When you do structural optimizations, and a few of you already started with volume optimizations, that means lattice parameter optimizations, we have some scripts like this optimized volume here, which generates automatically a series of struct files using or with different lattice parameters in the script, which is called optimized.job. You may edit this uh, script here, change convergence parameters, introduce parallelizations or use more iterations or so, maybe change the save LEPW line with a more specific name to describe your calculation that it was an LDA calculation or a particular Archimax value or, or what so else, and then run this optimize.job and plot or analyze the results. It will give you then the equilibrium lattice parameter Make sure that you get nice, a nice parabola out of this so that you are sure you got converged results. You can also combine this one-dimensional search just for volume for two-dimensional systems where in a tetragonal or hexagonal case you have also C over A and volume and optimize this simultaneously. An important concept of Wien to K is that Wien preserves symmetry. That means if you enter cubic titanium carbide, as we have done for the examples, it will stay cubic. You cannot start and initialize the calculation with a cubic titanium carbide and later on change the C lattice parameter. The calculation will be wrong, completely wrong. What you would have to do is you change C make it different from A and B at the beginning, introduce, so to say, a tetragonal distortion, initialize the calculation, 
And once the initialization is done, it will not give you these 48 symmetry operations, but only 16 in such a case. Then you can change back C to the cubic value and run the X optimize and optimize C of A. And hopefully you would get, of course, back in such a case that, that titanium carbide wants to be cubic and is not distorted. But in another case, it could be. The same is true for internal positions. If you do strontium pythonate or something like this, a perovskite, there is an ideal octahedra and no structural parameters. And WinTOK does not offer you any possibility to modify the atomic positions. However, you could distort these positions yourself in some way. Then you in initialize the calculation and then let the program find out automatically does it want to go back to the ideal octahedral position or does it want to have some, uh, some distortion because strontium titanate has at a particular volume a certain distortion, tortlet structure. Uh, a very important concept is the concept of supercells. We want not just be able to study known crystal compounds, something what we have done so far, let's say, where you take uh, the crystal structure from some database of some known compounds, but sooner or later all these known compounds are calculated. You may even find now in, in, on the web in databases almost all known crystal structures have been calculated by DFT and are stored in databases, so with a few clicks you find the band structure of a compound ABC. No problem nowadays. So the real challenge is now to make calculation for what we call real systems. What is a real system? Now a real system is, for instance, that your even single crystal may have impurities, vacancies, may be actually an alloy that means a mixture between two compounds, which might be disordered or what or kind of things, may have a surface or these kind of things, an interface between two materials or so. This is the type of simulations which we nowadays do most of the time, I would say. And the keyword, the way to do this is create a supercell. What means a supercell? So suppose my original cell is like this, and in this simple example has just primitive cubic with just one atom in the cell, then I could, for instance, generate a 2 by 2 by 2 supercell, making out a cell looking like this, and having now 8 atoms in the unit cell. One could then replace one out of these 8 atoms, remove it to uh, simulate a vacancy, uh, substitute it by another atom to have an impurity or things like this. Of course, the model depends on you, the quality of the model. Uh, if you want to study an impurity and you have only 8 atoms and replace one of them, that is of course not an impurity, this is a, uh, some alloy or concentrated uh, compound where you replace the uh, yeah, 12 or so percent uh, of, of your original material, so it's not an impurity. That means you would need to do a bigger supercell uh, to have a good model of a single impurity. Anyway, if you start with a cell which already has uh, 20 atoms or so, Doing a 2x2x2 two by two by two supercell might be too big, because this gives you then whatever 160 atoms or so, and this might be a little bit too big for your computational resources. So you want to be able to tailor the size of the supercell according to your needs. And one possibility is that you take this supercell, but now introduce a body-centered lattice. That means you make this atom and that atom in the center equivalent, and by that you don't have eight times as many atoms as in your original cell, but only four atoms. You could do another trick and do a face-centered atom, making this atom and all the faces equivalent, and by that your supercell has only two times the number of atoms of your original cell. So you are able more or less to increase the size of the supercell by a factor of two whatever was your starting number. Uh, 
uh, a second type of supercells would be what is usually called square two by square two supercells, where you start with this lattice and then define a new supercell where the new lattice vector is along the diagonal of this old one and therefore has a length of square root of two and is again a factor of two bigger than the original cells. If your starting cell is not cubic or close to cubic, try of course to generate supercells which are as cubic as possible, meaning if your starting cell was twice as long in the C direction, you may of course only use a supercell of 2 by 2 by 1, because then you get an approximate cube in your supercell. That would be the goal what you should do. Uh, you know, how do I do this? Well, Win2K offers two possible possibilities. There is a very simple program called Supercell, where you input your small struct file, your titanium carbide struct file, for instance, which you have generated before, and then you simply specify in an input the number of repetitions in X, Y, Z. Uh, you specify eventually the lattice. You can add also vacuum for surfaces. I'll come to this in a moment. You can also shift atoms, and in this way you very, very simply generate a bigger supercell. Once you have generated the supercell, you must change something. That means you must break symmetry because otherwise S group will restore from this generated supercell the original small struct file. Okay, because there is no symmetry breaking. I make a cell which is two times bigger than the original one. If there is nothing changed in the symmetry, S group will reduce this to the original cell. So, how do I break symmetry? Well, of course, I could replace one of the atoms simply by another atom or remove it, introduce a vacancy. I could displace one particular atom from its equilibrium positions, make a dis uh, displacement, for instance, for phonons, or, and that is one of the options which is very often used, I could label one atom. And labeling means I'm changing, for instance, iron to iron 1. There was this extra label field in the, in the structure generator, if you remember. And this tells the symmetry programs that iron 1 is not an iron atom. But it's something else. It's like if you put, put cobalt instead of iron, they are no longer equivalent by that. Now, this supercell program has one limitation. That means it works only along the unit cell axis. So you can not form what I presented here, this two by a square root 2 by a square root 2 supercell, but only cells with integer uh, multiplicity. There is a second program, it's called the Structure Editor, written by Robert a couple of years ago, which requires Octave. Octave is the public domain version of MATLAB. Every Linux should have an Octave. Maybe it's not installed, then ask your system administrator to install Octave also uh, on, on your computer. And for visualization, it's recommended to use Xcris then. And this structure editor allows, I would almost say, arbitrary complex operations on structure files. The drawback is you have to know a little bit about the syntax. So, for instance, you would start octave, then you would say S is equals to load struct, and this is one of the modules Robert has written, and enter the name of your small uh, structure file. And then you would define a matrix with three new vectors 100, 110, and 002, and make a new structure file with the command make supercell of S times A and you can with show struct uh, view the generated structure and look if it's that what is intended, what you intended. Once you are done, you can save it with save struct under certain name and uh, go out of this and continue with a regular initialization or modify it by changing an atom, labeling an atom iron to iron one or whatever I have uh, described before. 
this structure ed editor has many, many commands. There is a help struct, which gives you a list of all those commands. And there is a help uh, make supercell, which describes you how you should uh, input the, the syntax, what make supercell actually does, and, and how it is used. Yeah? What are these 1001, These are vectors. Like how you distort yourself? Like Not distort, with the new lattice vectors. So you have, let's say, your primitive vectors. They were 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, and 0, 0, 1. That was the original vectors. The new vectors would be 1, 0, so no change in x direction. But the y direction will now be this diagonal, 1, 1, 0. And the z direction will be twice as large in this example, right? So these are the lattice vector of the new supercell. Yeah. So from the previous point of breaking the symmetry, now uh, would it having some uh, surface atoms let something break the symmetry? Well, of course. Symmetry? If you introduce vacuum, you automatically break symmetry. So okay. Vacuum means the surface Vacuum means yeah. space. space. So it would ask you in the input, uh, I want to do a, I don't know, a five by one, uh, a one by one by five unit cell. I have an example uh, in a second. And then I would add some additional vacuum. We will all I'll come to surfaces in a moment. Okay. So there are many more commands. You can really do surfaces if arbitrary complexity, if you want. You can merge structures. You can replace atoms and all kinds of things. Um, you said that um, if you don't break the symmetry, symmetry. Uh, will, 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 will the supercell can lead you to a new symmetry? Or it will still... It will st if you do nothing, um, no, no, I mean, okay, I mean, if it is cubic and then you introduce vacancy, will it, will it bring some... That makes a new, yes, that makes a new symmetry, okay. So no problem. Yeah, yeah, no problem, of course, yeah. That will change the symmetry and then you need this large supercell. As long as you introduce, let's say, a vacuum, a, a, a vacancy. Yeah? So you must do one of those things. Thank basically, you. one of these three steps. Either replace an atom or remove it, displace it, or the changing the position, moving it a little bit on the side or so, or label one of those atoms as one, two, three, whatever you want. Yeah? So you would use, for instance, this supercell eventually also for magnetism. If you think about this cell, uh, uh, only one atom, that cannot be antiferromagnetic, for instance, right? Because there's only one atom. So you would need a supercell, and then you would say, okay, this ion is maybe a, a chromium-1, and this I, I call a chromium-2, and that means I will have chromium-1 with spin up and chromium-2 with spin down. Then I have this possibility. Here I have only one atom, so it can only have a test be ferromagnetic. There is no other way. Good. Surfaces. Surfaces are created with two-dimensional slabs, with a finite number of layers, and a vacuum in the third direction. So a typical unit cell would look like this, which is repeated periodically in all three directions, so in that direction. And here you see the vacuum in between. It has here seven layers, and this model of PCC iron 001 surface would be like this, that you have one unit cell of iron, that would be this one, and that a stack now three unit cells. So in the supercell program, you would say a one by one by three, one, two, three unit cells. And in addition, you would say, please repeat this atom also at the top, because remember, a box has only one unit cell has only these two atoms, these two and those. That would give you six layers. If you want to have seven layers, as in this model, you would say, please repeat this atom at zero, also at the top. And then you would add some vacuum. It's up to you. 30 power or something like this. So this is a little bit uh, too small, I would say. You should use 20 to 30 power vacuum. Uh, 
uh, to have a meaningful uh, symmetry, a meaningful vacuum. Uh, again, if you want to have a more complicated uh, surface like the 110 surface, this cannot be created by the supercell program. You need the structure editor from Robert for this. It's very simple. There's a make uh, surface command uh, similar, but there you can define a direction uh, and it will create slabs perpendicular to the 110 direction, as you can see here. The surfaces, one of the important quantities of a surface is the work function of a material that is defined as the energy difference between the Fermi level and the vacuum potential, which should be the constant potential far outside. So in Win2K, in the SCF cycle, in the SCF file, you can grab for a quantity V0 and you can also get the Fermi energy and the work function simply these differences. Be careful with this number. You should check the convergence with the size of your vacuum. That means with the size, how much vacuum do I put here? Because in principle, this should go to infinity. You should have an infinity large vacuum, which you of course never have, but uh, you can easily converge this and test this number, whether it's converged when you make this vacuum a little bit uh, thicker and you get the same numbers then your work function has been calculated. Okay, so total energies are half, of course, three contributions, an electrostatic energy, a kinetic energy contribution, the change correlation energy. And for our purpose, very important are now forces. Forces on an atom are defined as the negative derivative of this total energy with respect to the coordinates of these atoms. These forces are therefore a vector three-dimensional vector and there are three components in these forces the fam famous hellman feynman force uh, coming from the l equals one component of the potential and since our basis set is finite we have some Pulli corrections for the core and valence electrons and in particular this valence electron correction is not always calculated in wind 2 k but we use the sum of this and this term as a convergence check and only when it's converged we add this valence correction to the forces and that leads then to a run and this is activated only if you check for force convergence. So once I already uh, explained that if you do a structure with all positions fixed by symmetry you cannot do this force convergence because there is no free parameter. However, if you have a compound where you have at least one free parameter, here it's called u, u is a certain value, 0.312 or something like this, uh, this u can change without changing the symmetry of the system. And therefore, you can optimize or cal calculate the force on this oxygen atom, and if you would look how this FGL looks like, it would at the beginning change a lot and it would tell you something like partial forces here because only two terms are calculated and once these numbers are converged within one millirupberg, as you can see here, it would switch on automatically the third term and the force would be very very different from those numbers. So these numbers here are only useful for testing the conversions of the calculation that are not actual forces, okay? not correct forces, even by, by magnitude and direction, they could be completely off. Only if you read total next to the force numbers, then you have meaningful forces. What do I need forces for? Uh, very important for structural optimization of these internal parameters and of phonons. Uh, structure optimizations in two ways. The traditional way would be you have a double loop with fixed positions, you do an SCF cycle. Once you have done the SCF cycle, you modify the atomic positions using these forces and start another SCF cycle. The way is like this, that all those steps here 
are full SCF cycle, so 20 iterations, each of those steps. So in total, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine steps, nine geometry steps, makes 180 SCF cycles in total. An alternative scheme is uh, a new scheme introduced by Lawrence Marx is to fuse these two loops and optimize the SCF cycle, the density, and the atomic positions all at the same time. So the idea is now that each of these steps is only one single SCF cycle. Of course, then the step must be small, but the idea is that then in total you reach the minimum in much fewer steps than the other way around and if you compare for instance for uh, some larger problems the old scheme and the new scheme you see that you can reduce the number of cycles by factor two to three uh, and reach uh, very well uh, very well converged results or zero forces basically uh, another thing where you can use forces is for the calculation of phonons Calculations of phonons need an auxiliary program, for instance, the phonon program from Christoph Palinski. However, that is not a free code, it's fairly expensive, but there is an alternative uh, Togos Phonopti code, which you can uh, get the web on, on our unsupported software uh, site, uh, a link to this program, which is free of charge and which has an interface to Win2K. Now, Phonons are calculated by the direct method. That means you expand the total energy as a product of force constants, matrices, times displacements, U. And once you have these force constants uh, calculated, you can set up what is called the dynamic matrix. This is a mass weighted uh, quantity of those force constants times an exponential if you have k. Uh, a certain q vector of your phonon eventually involved and by diagonalization of this dynamic matrix you get then the square of the uh, phonon frequencies and the polarization vectors that means the displacement how a phonon displaces all your atoms in your crystal. Uh, important is that when you displace one of those atoms, let's say this atom, then this exerts uh, this displacement of this atom exerts a certain force on this atom. However, since when the unit cell is like this, you displace not only this atom but also that atom, and that means that atom and that atom, and that means all the sum of these displacements act on another atom. That's not what you want, except you are treating the gamma phonons, then it's okay. So therefore you use usually a bigger supercell like this. And when you now displace this atom, that means that that atom and those here are no, not displaced. Only this one will be displaced. And of course, the periodic image of that, so this one. But this force constant is now so far away from that atom that you can assume that the spring between these two atoms is basically zero. And that gives you now, leaves you with this spring alone and gives you a good uh, estimate of the force constant between these two atoms. Uh, and you have to repeat this displacement for all other atoms in the unit cell and by that set up the dynamic matrix. You get then a phonon band structure. And as I said, with a small, with a one by one by one unit cell, the only phonons which are correct are the phonons at the gamma point. Often that is all what you need because when you compare with infrared or Raman spectroscopy, you can measure only these gamma phonons. Okay? If you do neutron scattering, you can map out the complete uh, phonon band structure and then you better use a bigger supercell. Make sure that those interactions between the displacement in the original cell and the image, the periodically repeated image, is so big this distance that there is no, virtually no force in between. 
Once you have this, uh, you can calculate the phonon dense structure, you can calculate the density of states, phonon density of states, you can decompose it here, for instance, in this example, the germanium phonons are at lower frequency than the oxygen uh, phonons, obviously, because of mass. You can calculate internal energy, free energies, the entropy, heat capacity, or thermal displacement parameters. You can calculate free energies with this, and uh, with this, from such a formal calculations, you get formal frequencies. Compare with infrared, Raman, or neutron spectroscopies. You can identify dynamically unstable structures uh, as described here, and you will have one of the examples of strontium titanate in the exercises where you will see that cubic strontium titanate is unstable, it has an imaginary, often it's plotted as negative frequency, but it's an imaginary frequency. Uh, you get by diagonalization, a negative number which is equal to omega squared, so omega is imaginary, and that indicates you that strontium titanate doesn't want to be in the cubic structure, but wants to distort in a certain way. Uh, one can use this distortion even to find then the real crystal structure, the equilibrium structure, and you can calculate free energies as t at temperatures larger than zero. So from a T equals zero calculation, you can then, by using the quasi-harmonic approximation, get temperature-dependent uh, phase transitions uh, or temperature-dependent volume lattice parameter expansion as a function of temperature and all kind of these things. Okay, and I think with this I will stop. Any questions?